What's up, Greg? Welcome back to another episode of Bounty Hunters. So the submission is six days away, which means there's only going to be one more episode of this season. And then I want to hear from you guys what you want to see next. There's currently a Twin Guard and a Scarlet Dawn and a Player Bounty up for grabs. So leave a comment down below what you guys want to see next. So to start things off, we're watching me build a giant truss structure to put lights on. And this comes from last episode where we were discussing the day-night cycle. Uh, if you didn't see that video, go check it out. But we were discussing the day-night cycle. We're trying to figure out what to do about it. And someone suggested to just stick a bunch of lights on a big tower. So here we are. And it actually kind of worked. So to start things off, we're looking at the Jormungand. And over here is the large version of the Halberd that I've been working on. And what I'm doing right now is I'm copy and pasting over the missile controller. So this is the local weapon controller, the missile block, and the transmitter. And these components are what controls the ballista. And I need those. And then the automated control box that I just pasted over is the one that controls the flares, that controls firing the flares. And then I also need to copy over the munition decorator so that the ballista have their cute little crossbow bolts. And I kind of forgot to leave room in the eye compartment for this kind of thing, so you can see I'm making some room there. Now we're moving to the time lapse, and I got tipped off in a Discord DM that the floor of the Onyx Watch ships are actually supposed to be staggered like this, and I don't actually like this style. I originally didn't do it on purpose because I prefer it to be like clean and smooth, and I don't like this staggered look. But apparently, it's a requirement with the Onyx Watch. So while I'm doing the flares, I figured I would take the opportunity and fix the floor as well. And you will see this is becoming a theme throughout the video of fixing all the floors. So I got rid of what were previously there for the missile silos, and now I went back to the Jormungand again, and you see I'm just going to prefab the flare structure, and I'm just going to copy it right over. Now the Jormungand actually only has two flares, but I'm going to be putting four flares on my boat. So that means this boat is going to be a little bit better against infrared tracking missiles, which I think is a really good thing because a lot of planes in front of the depths use infrared tracking missiles. So I really hope that's just going to help with its anti-air capability. Once I paste that in, you can see I'll go back to the time-lapse view. We're going underneath now. You can see I'm going to just duplicate the flare thing and connect it up with the missile connectors. And then just like in the underside of the ship, I'm replacing or I'm filling in all the walls with alloy. I really want to make sure it's too thick all the way around. I want a layer of metal and then a layer of alloy. And then I'm also compartmentalizing the flares to keep them separate. Once again, replacing some of the floor to make it staggered, and then I'm right underneath that floor, I'm going to fill it in with alloy so that uh, you've got the too thick layering there with the deck. Even though this is inside the superstructure, it's still important to have the deck be layered because realistically the superstructure is just there for looks, it's not really there for armor. So as you can see, I'm going through the internals and just layering it up, and I'm not going to work on too much of the inside of the superstructure. Uh, you can see it's pretty bare right now, unlike the other one that I worked on last episode. But that is for next episode. Next episode, I will be working on the interior of this. But for now, I'm just filling in some of the floor to make sure it is nice and consistent. So way back in episode one of this bounty hunting series, I asked you guys which of these three variants you guys thought looked the best. And I overwhelmingly heard that number two was the best. But what I did not tell you is that I only built it on one side. That's right, I was lazy and I forgot mirror mode. So in addition to having to extrapolate this to the five barrel version and not just the two barrel version, I'm also gonna have to make sure I use mirror mode this time. So speaking of feedback that I received from these quintuple turrets, uh, I also received feedback that the barrels were not very good. So you can see on the two barrel versions, I don't have the final bit, I forget what that's called. I think it's the flash suppressor. So no more flash suppressor, I got some feedback from that in the Discord channel. And also the Discord said there was too much blue, even though I really like the blue color. I think it's a really nice color scheme, but apparently we need less blue. So with that, I'm also gonna be getting rid of a lot of the blue. And I found out that it's actually kind of hard to put what I did in the second version over there to this version because there I can't put a slope on the edge there, but anyway. Moving on, I tilted the gun up so we can see what's going on on the front here. And I thought it'd be cute to do like some kind of crenellation thing on the front, just like how the Onyx Watch ships are crenellated all the way around. So following the Onyx Watch like style of like putting the slope up to the flat wall and then the crenellation on top, 
I think I did a good job, but I think both sides of this look really nice. So now I'm getting rid of the top section, and the reason for that is because we're moving on to building the top section just over here. I put on shift piece, so you can see what I'm doing because I'm only working on the inside. But you can see I replaced all the barrels as well. All the barrels, the flash suppressor is gone, and the uh, blue is painted a little nicer. I think I changed the blue, I don't remember. Then I replaced all the fragmentation with HE, and I decided I'm not going to redo the Tetris on the inside of this. I think the Tetris is already pretty much good. I was going to redo the Tetris, but I don't really think there's going to be much of a benefit to doing that. And if I'm going to redo the Tetris, I think I'm just going to redo the whole gun. Spoiler alert, stay tuned to next week anyways. So you can see I just replaced it with HE, and then those blocks appeared because I painted away the blue, and I just replaced them with the regular colors. So no more blue, no more frag, now it's pure HE, and now I just gotta put it all together. Now you may recall that we had previously already retrofitted the secondary guns, but I did some further retrofitation, retro, retrofit, I guess I'm further retrofitting um, between then and now. So first of all, I got rid of the rotating inner piece, even though I thought it was cool. I was having some issues when the ship would tilt that it would go all kinds of out of whack, so you can't be having that, so I got rid of it, unfortunately. But I did just put in this like nice circular-ish shape here, made it out of just like slopes, uh, and it works just as fine. You can barely even notice the difference, so it's all good. Uh, there's not really any changes down below, but in the actual cram thing, I did set it to prefer low, and I could set it to rotate when reloading. I won't. So now we are back to the time lapse, and you can see my first step is to get rid of all the sub objects on my ship, and then I'm gonna go across the entire ship and redo all of the decking. And this probably was way more difficult than it needed to be, but I just could not figure out how to count. I was like really struggling with this. Anyways, you can also see that nighttime, you can still see the ship, so I think the lights are working pretty well. I think that was a pretty good example of the lights, so leave a comment down below if you know how to fix the daylight cycle, or what you think of these lights. So I'm just finishing up the decking here, and then I'm going to delete the ship and replace it, because there's some kind of weird bug in From the Depths where if you don't, if you delete a sub-object, uh, it like leaves the corners of the turret piece still intact, but you can't remove them, so there's like an invisible block. Anyway, it's, it's a weird bug. So I had to replace the entire ship in order to put the sub-objects back, but I put down all the new versions of the turrets, and this is it right here, and it's kind of hard to see right now, but I'm actually putting down a bunch of detection components all over the boat as well. And then I'm going to get out the small halberd, and I'm going to give it the same treatment. I'm going to also fix the decorations on the missile turrets and make sure the missile turrets are all set up. I'm also setting up the gun sink and the firing restrictions and all that fun stuff for both of these boats. And you might notice that the smaller halberd has some kind of crazy cannon on the front of it that's being lit up because I, and I didn't notice because that was multiplayer glitch in from the depths. So let me take you back in time and give a little explanation as to what the heck that thing is on the front of my boat. Now, fair warning, this next section gets pretty technical and in-depth, but From the Depths is a pretty technical game, so I decided I wanted to keep it in here anyways. If you liked the video so far, please leave a like and comment, and leave a comment down below if you want to see more of this kind of technical in-depth stuff, or if you want me to just cut it out and keep it to the fun, quick and dirty explanations. But if you're not interested in seeing this stuff, you can skip right to the combat testing, which is going to be at 22.45. So while I was building my quintuple barrel gun over here, I really wanted to make a rotary cram gun, kind of like a revolver. So this was my original concept. Basically the idea is you can see down these like tubes that I've made out of these, ang these are angled blocks here. Um, down these tubes you can see down at the bottom there there's like a blank block there, there's like a block that has its full space. So therefore this would not be cheese. Uh, that was a big concern the cheese factor of this because it's easy to make a rotary cram with like a hundred cram turrets but it's really hard to make one that is legit in the game and doesn't involve spin clipping. So this was my first attempt you can see down these tubes I have these holes and they are also spaced perfectly so that if I rotate this to zero uh, you will see that the firing pieces line up with where those holes were. So this was kind of my concept, is that if I had two of these things stacked on top of each other, but so if I had 
fire and pieces down here on a second layer of this, then you see that they would in fact line up, and this would be lined up with uh, this rotation piece. However, I didn't really like the geometry that this was getting. Uh, there's a lot of waste space. This cam Tetris looks like it was going to be terrible because we've got explosive pellets with only one connection. And so I might as well just go bigger. Before we look at the result, I'm just going to go through my process for making it bigger. And basically my idea was to stick a spin block down and then stick some blocks on the end of it, just like this, and then rotate this to 45 degrees. And now what I'm looking for is a point where uh, the blocks on this truss line up with the blocks on my grid underneath. And you can see that it lines up pretty well, although not perfectly in this square right here. So that's a spin block, two blocks, and then this square right here lines up pretty well, not perfectly, but you're never gonna get perfect. So I'm gonna have to settle for that. With that in mind, I've ever created this cram Tetris. So the interesting thing is that this explosive pellet is a center, as we know. And so we have two blocks and then a spin block, or then a uh, firing piece. So the firing piece belongs here. Of course, that's not actually connected to anything at the moment, but we'll ignore that for now. The other important thing is that on the diagonal, so that's one, two diagonal, this has to be completely empty. And the nice thing about the way I've done this Prime Tetris is that we're losing out on explosive pellets rather than payload packers or other things. And this really helps to preserve the material efficiency of the cram. So each of this was going to be one slice of my cram gun, but I need to connect all these different uh, connectors and stuff. The good news is that I actually only need to connect four firing pieces to this particular slice, and then what I'm going to do is connect an additional four to another slice that's rotated at 45 degrees. If I put the firing piece right here, and then get rid of these two because I don't want those, and then connect in this, like so, and then since it's rotationally symmetric, it would connect in like that way. This just works. And that's pretty much what I've got going on here. You notice the firing pieces are not installed. That's because I only install the firing pieces in the final product. You can see this version. On this particular slice, I actually have the uh, laser targeters and the, these things, what are they called? Fusing boxes on this particular slice. And that's because this slice is essentially like the starting slice. Not necessarily where the firing pieces go, but this is the connecting slice. This is where all the different uh, pillars of connectors get connected. And this is where the fusing boxes and laser targeters live. So what I ended up with are two prefabs. And I called one the slice starter and one the slice repeater. And the idea is that if I put down a slice starter, then I can just spam slice repeaters on top and they will all be connected. And so, I created this monstrosity. So, what we're looking at here is actually a 360 turret with light blocks. These are uh, not very often used, but they're pretty useful. They are completely ethereal, and you can still connect things to it, but they don't get hit, and they don't uh, interact with things, and uh, they're like, how you spin clipping, but without cheating, basically. And so, it's really hard to see, and I apologize for that. And I don't think there's a way to actually, um... Let me just see. No. There is no way to actually view what is happening here, because these are all cram components, so I apologize. I deeply apologize. But if we follow my cursor, you can see there are light blocks all the way in here. All the way up front over to here and next to these light blocks are two spin blocks and these spin blocks are rotated off from each other by 45 degrees so that allows the back spin blocks uh, firing pieces to have their barrels go straight through the other cram gun as you can see so this firing pieces cram this firing piece is way back here and it goes straight through the front cram gun just like that now as you can see on this version that's flat here as well I also made sure to keep it within the bounds of a turret rotation so that I'm not cheating when I'm building the outer holder for it. The actual turret itself fits into this, which happens to be the same size as the other, as a quintuple turret over there. 
Now, I could have this cram gun rotating all the time, but I really didn't want to have it rotating all the time. Plus, there is a bit of an issue where if the bottom gun fires, or begins firing, then every time it rotates, the bottom gun will always fire. You notice this sometimes with APS and stuff. But since this is such a large distance between these two, I really want the top one to always be firing. I only want the top gun to be firing. And the reason for that mostly is so that if I happen to be aiming like down or across my ship or something like that, I'm less likely to hit myself if I'm firing from the top gun rather than firing from the bottom gun. So with that in mind, that led me to create this breadboard to control it. So the way this breadboard works is that we detect when a cram fires, and then we count how many crams have just been fired. We'll ignore this for a moment. We're doing some math to figure out which cram gun is up next to fire, and then rotating that cram gun to the top. And then these are the two spin blocks, and we're simply rotating each of them accordingly. And this one is offset by 45 degrees, and then inverted because it's facing the wrong way. Now, heading back to this, the reason this exists is because the cram guns are all using the gun sync to each other. And if I miss my firing rate, which means if I go more than two seconds without firing, then that means the whole system is stopped firing and I need to rotate the gun back to the original cram, the cram that fires to begin the whole sync operation. So if this timer hits zero, which it is currently hitting zero because we're not firing, then we rotate back around to the zeroth position which just means basically that we stopped firing and it's just a reset. So there are some issues with this, unfortunately, and I spent probably like eight to 10 hours uh, figuring this out, so whoops. Um, but the basic issues are that number one, we're detecting when the cram fires, but this counts for any cram on the entire ship. So I, if I have any cram guns on the ship that aren't this turret, then they're gonna be screwing up my day. I also realized that if I use the rate controller rather than the angle control, then I could have the cannon movement much smoother and look nicer. So I did a little mining off camera, as they say, and I created this. So between that version and this version, there were quite a few changes. Namely, I re I named all of these, so you can see they're all named. This is RC, which stands for Rotary Cannon 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way around to 7. And if we happen to select it and fire it... Hello, can I please hop in the chair? Thank you. One issue with this gun which I don't know why this is the case, but every time I paste it down, all the sync settings are screwed up. So if you were commenting down below, you should do gun sync, you should do, you should set firing restrictions, all those kind of comments. I really appreciate the concern, but this is why I don't do it until last. As you can see, I just put this down and now this one is not synced as correct. This one should be synced to the one we were just looking at. It's synced to ID6 cram firing piece. I don't even know what that is because the one we should be synced to is ID9, and it's not called Cram Firing Piece, it's called RC6, or RC0, I should say. So if I go around and make all of these sync, so that one is correctly synced, this one is correctly synced, this one is correctly synced, and this one's not correctly synced. So two out of the eight cannons got their sync screwed up by me putting it down, and I don't know why. Anyways. As you can see, the top cannon fires and then it rotates by 45 degrees so the next cannon is in line to fire. Also, the rotation is quite smooth and I'm very proud of that. So in the back here of this, uh, it kind of looks like one of those like things that you grab onto and spin, like it's like a, it's like a twist thing. So now the breadboard looks like this. So on the left here, we have one block getter for each firing piece. And so these are named RC0 through 7, as we discussed. Whenever one of those fires, it gets added up in this massive expression. And this is the same as before. So this is the countdown, the reset timer, and this is the counter. Then we are simply taking the counter 
multiplying it by 45, and then we have some nonsense here. So this is all to do with this PID right here. I decided to use a PID because I wanted it to be nice and smooth motion. I didn't want any jitteriness. I want it to look really nice and smooth. This math returns the shortest distance in degrees from the target. The reason I have this math here is because if we are at 355 degrees and we're trying to move to 5 degrees, the PID controller doesn't recognize that you can just go 10 degrees over. Basically what it does is it computes the two different options of, going, of rotating clockwise or counterclockwise and then returns the smaller of the two. Not exactly what it does, but that's, that, that's the result. This is the input from the spin block and this is the input from where we want to be. This is where we want to be, this is where we are. And so this returns the, the distance that we plan on moving with zero being where we are currently. So this does the math relative to the rotating cannon rather than... Then we have the PID controller here. This multiplies by negative five. So this simply sets the rate control in radians. So if the PID is saying one, that means I'm going negative five radians per second. And then we put this into both spin blocks at the same time, which I was able to do because the rate control is able to be flipped on one of them because I can set it to continuous reverse. And when I'm using the rate control, I can give the spin block a resting angle so that I don't have to fiddle with breadboard logic to make that happen. Another reason that I chose to do the PID is that I can control the spin blocks with rate control rather than angle control. And that does make the motion smoother, but that also helps with a lot of uh, some of the jankier stuff that I was experiencing and helps keep both the cannons aligned. The reload time for each of these guns is about 10 seconds. Uh, you can see that here, this is at 100% packing. However, the other ones are reporting only eight seconds. The reason for that is because I have this set to a minimum packing. And the reason I have for that is that I really don't want these side guns to miss their firing cycle because I have these set to maximum waiting time. And this is actually important because I really don't want these guns firing out of cycle. So this gun has to fire first, and it has to be fully packed. If this gun is fully packed and fires first, then this one is definitely going to be at least 80% packed. And then it will fire, it will fire, it will fire, it will fire all the way around in the circle. Well, hopefully you didn't get terribly bored listening to all that, and hopefully you guys are still watching. This is going to be one of the longer combat tests that I've done so far. We're going to start it with the large version of the Halberd versus two Felix B5 Geyers because the Halberd costs about 300k materials and each B5 Geyer costs about 180k, so it's only fair in material cost to go up against something a little bit tougher, plus a steep park card, so we should be able to handle it. And as you'll see, it's not as good as I would have hoped, and I do think that uh, the Halberd, first of all, you can see the second secondary gun is completely screwed up, but not just that. I also think we just kind of got unlucky with some of the shots. So during this combat test, you can see that the second from the front secondary gun on both sides is not rotating, and that's because I screwed up the deck, and I only realized that while I was editing this video, but don't worry, it is already fixed because I could not let it sit. So I went and did it while you guys weren't watching, but for next time it will be fixed and for this submission, it will be fixed. Uh, but you can see the synchronization of the guns is working really well. I really like the way it's firing all the synchronized guns, which is great. But another somewhat downside is I did notice a few times, although it's much better now that I've fixed the fail safes, I'm still firing at our own, yeah, you can just see right there, we're still hitting ourselves a couple of times here and there. So I do still need to go into the weapon settings and fix that as well. On the topic of things that still need to be done, you also may know that the inside of the superstructure is still unfinished. That will be for next episode. Leave comments down below what you think I should put in there. And... Seeing as this is very long in combat test, I have no idea what to say for most of this, so leave a comment down below if you want me to try and commentate over all of this, or if I should just sit back and let some music play.
we have finally won. So yeah, we beat the B5 Geyers, so that means that's good. I mean, that's like the bare minimum, I would say. So we succeeded. We still have a lot of weapons operational, which is good to see. You can see the damage here. Uh, it's a really good idea that we put a lot of extra armoring on top of the AI because last episode that we did a combat test, we got AI dead pretty early. But you can see most of the weapons are still operational. The AI isn't dead. The steam engine is still working as well. So overall, I would say this combat test was a pretty big success. Now we're moving on to the small halberd versus a B5 Geyer, and it's only one this time because the small halberd cost less than one B5 Geyer, so this is already uh, fighting up, an, up a weight class here. And you can see the 8 barrel cram gun is actually really fun because it just it just keeps firing, it just doesn't stop. It just, like, almost once a second it keeps firing, and that those extra shots in there where the secondary is firing, and it just keeps going, it just doesn't stop. I mean, I kind of love this thing. And just like that, we've already won. Yeah, we already won. I do think we got a little bit luckier than the previous fight, but that's pretty incredible to beat this thing with one pass. And it's still trying to fire, but now the fail safes are kind of messing with it. But yeah, I'm really impressed with this gun. But let's try that again, but with two B5 Geyers. So here they come, they're coming in from the distance, and you can see we're starting to fire. And you're going to see in this fight that the B5s actually have quite a better chance. I think we did get unlucky with a lot of these early shots missing. If we hit these early shots, we can take one down early, and that's probably going to help us a lot in the long run. But I don't think we managed to do that. You can see the turret is rotating nicely. I really like the way that turret looks. It is a little bit comically huge, but I love it anyways. But you can see the first pass is over and neither plane is down, which kind of sucks. And I think the fire rate for this gun is actually being hurt by the fact that there's multiple targets and it keeps switching targets. Every time it switches targets, it has to stop and restart its entire firing cycle. So you can see it switched there and now it has to roll itself all the way back to the beginning and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait before firing again. So that is kind of a downside with this turret design. but. That's just how it is, and uh, I'll let you guys watch the combat. So I haven't actually put very much detection on this ship just yet. There used to be detection on the rotating gun which has been blown off and just there the spotlight got blown off as well and spotlight was the other detection. Which means now we are completely blind against two B5 Geyers but one of them at the same time as taking out our detection has just crashed into the ocean. Which means we're really only fighting one B5 Geyer.
And after a few probably pretty lucky shots, we actually managed to take out the second B5 Geiger as well, even though we have no detection. Well, very limited detection, I should say, right now. Because I think there is still some detection components, but they're kind of not that good. Anyways, that's going to be the end of the video. You can see the uh, damage on this before we go. So yeah, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know feedback.